Thank you so much. Clarissa, I'll have you jump in next. Yeah, um, I wanted to first thank you all for hosting this session and for having us. And uh, I wish that I was going door knocking uh, in any neighborhood with Evelyn. Um, there are so many folks, as you know, Evelyn, um, you know, every time that we are out there doing voter registration or get out the vote, so many Latinos say, nobody has ever come to my door. Nobody has ever talked to me about registering to vote or inviting me into the process. And that is a small gesture, but it matters so much. And building on that, as Sonia mentioned, right? So Latinos are geographically concentrated in states that are rich in primary delegates and their electoral and electoral college votes are battleground states or both. And given the razor thin margins, of course, they are definitely in significant numbers and they are going to play a decisive role no matter what in places like Arizona and Nevada. But because of the razor thin margins, right, the reality is that Latino voters cast ballots, not that they are there in those numbers, they cast ballots in numbers greater than the margin of victory in 2020 in places like also, in addition to California and Nevada, uh, I'm sorry, Arizona and Nevada, in places like California, Florida, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, Texas, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, right? We are a national community. I think a lot of times people think about Latino voters or Latinos and think about California, Florida, Texas, maybe New York, but we are a growing national community and that influence is gonna be there. I think that the other piece is that Latinos do not have, have not traditionally had a straight party line vote on the one hand or exhibited the same patterns as say black voters. So Latino support has tended to be in the in the aggregate about two thirds, one third, right? When it's all said and done, about two thirds of the support of this electorate, speaking at the presidential level, ends up on the Democratic side, about one third on the Republican side. And while you have heard a lot of chatter about these seismic shifts in support in the Latino electorate, the reality is that um, that's not the case. There is movement, and particularly because we are a young electorate. So of the 17 and a half million voters that uh, Evelyn was talking about, one in five Latinos who are expected to cast a ballot in 2024 are gonna be doing so for the first time in a presidential election. So some of the churn we are seeing exaggerated as it might be, that is not accurate, but there is churn. And a lot of that churn is actually among newer voters who are coming into the process, who are forming their opinion about parties and candidates and who are doing so at a time that like many of us here and around the country, there's a lot of frustration about problems that the nation is facing and has faced for a very long time that continue to not get resolved. Now, many of us may know that it's because the stalemate in Congress or this or that or the other, but for a lot of folks coming into the process, right? Just like with the economy, people interpret what's happening in my pocketbook and who's in charge. And so some of those things are impacting this electorate. That said, uh, and I know that Camille's probably gonna be going deeper into voters, uh, young voters as well. Let's not forget this. A lot of times people talk about Latino voters and whether or not they vote. What we have is a voter registration opportunity gap because in presidential elections, more than 80% of Latinos who are registered vote. The last presidential was actually 88%. So registering somebody to vote has a great 
outcome, uh, a great payout in terms of return and investment. And that's why the work of inviting people into the process and making sure they have the tools to exercise their, their, their right to vote, given so many obstacles, remains key. And I know we're going to talk more about that. So uh, I'll pass it on. Thank you so much, 